I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm presenting some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. This particular installment is the second of two videos in which I'm discussing the origins and development of the philosophical concept of aesthetics in Western modernity. And in both of these videos, I'll be excerpting some segments from a talk I gave at the Central University of Kerala in Kasuragod, India, in January of 2018. In the earlier video, I looked at the origins of the concept of the aesthetic in the 18th century, and also looked at the contributions of Immanuel Kant. I'll pick up the thread here with a consideration of Kant's contemporary, Friedrich Schiller. Kant's attention to the political function of aesthetic perception established a framework for critical reevaluations of democratic governmentality that continues through the succeeding stages of modernity. But a number of recent theorists have returned to the thought of Kant's contemporary, Friedrich Schiller, for a more complex articulation of aesthetics and politics. As Gaetri Spivak and others have noticed, in his Letters on the Aesthetic Education of Man, Schiller misreads Kant's critique of judgment in a way that gives a wider scope of political importance to the aesthetic experience. For Schiller, human consciousness is characterized by conflicting drive. One of these is a sense drive, that is, the source of sensual experience and phenomenal perception. The sense drive is finite and physical, and the consciousness produced by it must be regulated by a form of drive, which can be associated with absolute reason. That's Kant's sublime, really. Mediating between these competing drives of sense and form is the play drive, which is the field of aesthetics. For Kant, sensual perceptions and aesthetic judgment remain subordinate to rational thought and conceptual knowledge, but aesthetics can provide access imperfectly to the sublime or absolute reason. By contrast, in the processes of the play drive, Schiller's sensual perception engages on an equal basis with absolute reason. This mediatory preeminence introduces an element of contingency into the categories of human subjectivity, what it means to be human, how one becomes a citizen, that anticipate a key concern of postmodern theory. There's a genealogical connection between Schiller's robust field of aesthetics and the materialist accounts of human subjectivity that were to be developed by Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche. In each of these thinkers, humans are constructions of material conditions and social processes, not Cartesian subjects discovering their own truths. Schiller also recognized in industrial modernity a tendency toward alienation and fragmentation of individual subjects and of communities that would become a theme of Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, and the Frankfurt School critical theorists, among many others. Thus, Schiller's aesthetics makes a turning point in modern individualism. If we notice the emergence of modern individualism in the Cartesian cogito, I think, therefore, I am, along with the rise of democratic citizenship, capitalism, and mass society, we can recognize the decline of the modern individual in postmodern performative and contingent subjectivity and post-industrial consumerism. From this moment forward, it will be increasingly difficult to uphold the concepts of autonomous individualism and a universal humanity in modernity. This can be asserted even while we have to acknowledge the powerful forces brought to bear precisely to promote the idea of individual autonomy. And I'll mention two of them here. These were quite often spectacularly and specifically aesthetic forces. For example, the literary form of the Bildungsroman, the novel in which we see a young person facing some crises and struggles and slowly and gradually developing into maturity in a modern democratic society. The Bildungsroman also privileges a form of writing that cultivates this feeling of interiority. As we read the Bildungsroman, we feel like we are the hero. 
going through these struggles. This could be me finding my way. We all can be bourgeois subjects in the Bildungsroman. So in modernity, the ideological contradiction between the tendency toward individualism and an opposing tendency toward normalization is reconciled symbolically in aesthetic response and functionally in the processes of Bildung or the individual's acculturation. This reconciliation in modern society's confidence in the individual's capacity for self-knowledge and universal understanding has become increasingly difficult to sustain in late modernity after the advent of mass society. One other example of the political relevance of aesthetics is in the system of higher education. I don't know if any of you have ever had occasion to read Kant's Conflict of the Faculties. Kant posits two different forces within the faculty. One he calls the lower faculty. And the lower faculty for Kant consists of philosophy especially, but also the traditional liberal arts. The higher fact would be the so-called vocational areas, the vocational subjects, medicine and law and engineering and finance and those things. Even though he calls philosophy, and by extension I would say cultural studies and literary studies and all of our liberal arts concerns, lower faculties, for him, lower is better. The lower is more basic, more fundamental. And he argues that these lower faculties will from time to time have to correct the errors of vocational faculties, these vocational subjects, in which the faculty are taking for granted taking as self-evident values and perceptions and understandings of reality and history that are, in fact, narrow and limited and easily critiqued. In, in our current context, if we can broaden philosophy to include literary and cultural theory and substitute the practice of critique for Kant's application of pure reason, this is a good description of our proper role in the humanities or as cultural studies scholars and practitioners and as cultural workers in relation to the technical and vocational programs in the neoliberal technocentric 21st century academy around the world as I see it, not just in the metropole. Ironically, one way the political importance of the aesthetic manifests itself is by the aesthetic flight from politics, the celebration of art as a rejection of didacticism, moralism, and utilitarianism that echoes from the late romantics through 19th century bohemianism and art for art's sake, and all the way through to the Frankfurt School. By the 1930s, with the emergence of mass society, along with photographs, phonographs, cinema, and broadcast media, it was clear, as Horkheimer and Adorno were to argue in their essay, Enlightenment as Mass Deception, that the Enlightenment dream of a citizenship of informed, political agency was faltering. Walter Benjamin responded to this. He analyzed how art and culture and ideology are functioning in late capitalism. Benjamin recognizes that fascism succeeds in large part by aestheticizing the political. Remarking famously that fascism is the aestheticization of politics, Benjamin is especially prescient in his recognition of how the masses are enlisted vicariously into the scheme of glorification of the warrior leader. He writes, all effort to render politics aesthetic culminates in one thing, war. War and war only can set a goal for mass movements on the largest scale while respecting the traditional property system. He goes without saying that the fascist apotheosis of war does not employ such arguments fascism expects war to supply the artistic gratification of a sense perception that has been changed by technology. This is the situation of politics in which fascism is rendered aesthetic. From this point in that talk, I shifted to an account of the academic field of cultural studies in the past few decades. Here, instead, I'll focus on literary studies. Benjamin's concern was that in a modern technological society, in an age of mass communication, rational political discourse can be overwhelmed by a concerted, sophisticated appeal to emotions. This is the strategy of fascism. His response to fascism's aestheticization of politics is to recognize the political necessity of the aesthetic. What's the difference? To aestheticize politics is to empty political discourse 
of rational content, to make politics only an appeal to emotion. There is no possibility for critical engagement in such a political discourse. The politicization of aesthetics, on the other hand, recognizes that aesthetic experience bonds citizens together emotionally, but at the same time provides an arena for the critical appreciation of and an ongoing affirmation and renegotiation of social cultural values. Shaftesbury, Kant, and Schiller all describe aesthetic response as a sublime experience. It is not something that can be defined with precision or finality. They all recognize that the capacity for aesthetic appreciation must be cultivated. That is the proper role of literary studies in a democratic society. There is an inherently conservative tendency in the study of literature because its subject matter is in large part a received tradition, the literary canon. There will be progressive or radical interventions from time to time, such as the identity politics movement of the last part of the 20th century that led to an enlargement of the canon to include more works by women and non-white authors. But literary study is properly political and necessary for a technologized society with sophisticated social media in a deeper sense. It develops the capacity for critical appreciation, rational discussion, and debate of social values among citizens who share some degree of common awareness of our social traditions and a common symbolic language with which to affirm and renegotiate our understandings of those traditions. Here's how the contemporary American philosopher Martha Nussbaum puts the case. If we do not insist on the crucial importance of the humanities and the arts, they will drop away because they do not make money. They only do what is much more precious than that, make a world that is worth living in. People who are able to see other human beings as full people, with thoughts and feelings of their own that deserve respect and empathy, and nations that are able to overcome fear and suspicion in favor of sympathetic and reasonable debate. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. As always, if you have questions or comments, send me an email.